Yeah, so OpenFlow is a great operational example. One great operational example of SDN, but it's not in and of itself SDN. Right? We kind of have unfortunately seen the, the, the marketing of SDN uh, over rotate on the OpenFlow side, but it's a great way we can, we can talk about the topic. So, um, to further complicate your question, actually, there's 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 infrastructure uh, in terms of the physical devices that have, as they evolve today, if, especially if they're existing infrastructure that's been adapted to, let's say, run open. There are certain services, capabilities, control, management, data plane, uh, configurations against from those switches that are evolving. So first of all, we have to understand that if we're adding connectors or agents that let us talk between existing infrastructure to external controllers, we, we have to ensure that that, that communication path is, is, is well um, protected. Today, what that generally means is I'll run SSL, TLS, and you know, do encryption transport uh, with certificates. Um, and that's that's about the extent of what most of these uh, specs like we're talking about today. Right? I'll, just, I'll, I'll do T SSL, TLS with certs between a controller and a switch, and whatever happens between you guys happens between you guys. Um, that's not exactly, uh, that's not really taking uh, security concerns of, of attack vectors and threats to you know, seriously. Um, the, I think what's interesting is when you look at the capability for a controller to otherwise um, manipulate flows within a switch router or a firewall, uh, you have to look at the, what, what sits on top of the controllers that are actually um, enabling uh, the redirection of flows of traffic, which are quote-unquote trusted apps that sit there and get information from sure. other pieces of the stack. And so the trust relationships between these apps or connectors or plugins that sit on top of the controller that then control the router switches and firewalls networking kit is actually uh, is, is really uh, the, the first bubble I draw around the things we need to talk about protecting. Got it. Because when I first heard of SDN and when I talked to people about it, um, I see it as a single point of failure because if I'm abstracting a whole network and putting it on a single floodlight controller, as an attacker, I'm going to hit floodlight and I'm going to take your whole network. Is that a simplistic way or is that no, realistic? I think, it's, I think it's a reasonable threat modeling way of looking at things. If you look at how our discussions uh, track when we were talking about what virtualization did uh, to us, right? We end up, uh, if you're an attacker looking to compromise infrastructure, virtual, physical, or combination thereof, the easiest thing to do is go after the management plane, right? Sure. It's where you go. So whether you have a single controller, a distributed controller, or a combination of above, the management plane, which is why I said securing SDN is the first step, sure. is always and should always be the first uh, thing we, we, we think about. Um, so no, I don't think it's overly simplistic. I think it's a great way of conceptualizing the fact that whether your controller architecture allows you to distribute state and has high availability and resiliency um, in it. The, the point being that anytime we, we expand the attack surface by putting the control capabilities, sure. management capabilities outside of these switches, it's, you're expanding the attack surface. So that's, that's exactly and then from your own evaluation, um, our controller infrastructure platforms today kind of, sort of, maybe secure, or is it? Does there need to be additional layers of wrappers around it as you would any other kind of technology? Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think it's the latter. Uh, okay. Today, most of the controller architectures, uh, as they start to evolve, are, uh, especially the ones that are based on OpenFlow, um, I mean, some of the security options, if you read through the specs, uh, are optional. Like, you don't have to use SSL TLS between a controller and a switch. Really? No. And, and, and they, uh, do they... Do they specify TLS two or three, or uh, they don't no, care? I don't, I don't remember. The point okay. being, the fact that encryption is, is optional at all is kind of crazy. But the, the point being yeah. that in many cases we're really going to have to think about. You know, we never really get away from defense in depth. We have to think about yeah. the uh, attackers, their motivation, how they will think about compromising uh, particular trusted paths, and do our best to threat bomb against it. But you know, the reality is a lot of the control infrastructure today, a lot of what we see as SDN, is is just open flow growing up. But there's a whole new generation of, of SDN that's starting to um, evolve that includes um, more than just a controller that you manipulate a, a physical switch or router or piece of firewall network gear. It's also now featuring virtual routers, virtual switches, the tunnels and overlays that sit on top in the virtual space as well as the physical. And uh, you know, that in and of itself as we saw with server virtualization, make sure visibility into what's going on in each of these layers uh, challenging. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really, when we think about what your question meant, do we have to add layers? Certainly, but the problem is which operational teams and groups actually manages the security of those layers. Physical networking guys like physical boxes with gazettes and gazetta cables. They're used to physical boxes. 
and their kind of scope has traditionally ended at the Ethernet port that feeds into a server. Sure. With server virtualization, we saw what happened with the addition of, of virtual switches. Sure. Uh, that's caused operational discord between those two groups. Sure. So now you got physical, you got virtual, and now with overlays with other virtual switches on top of virtual switches, you have overlays on top of overlays on top of underlays. You can imagine the fun. So where is the, um, from a security point of view, where is the source of truth then? Who is responsible if there is a person or where should control lie? Yeah, good question. So uh, I think there are um, multiple ways of answering that question. There's the configuration uh, uh, of, um, and the type of, the types of, of, of data and configuration and management planes really do differ depending on what you're talking about component wise. So you have provisioning and orchestration of VMs and virtual appliances that may control where where actual workloads are placed and they may actually say that workload requires these particular security services. Yeah. So that's one area of Sure. You've got um, the actual um, orchestration and provisioning of custom virtual appliances that may require certain network configurations yeah. outside of the cloud or virtualization stack. You have the actual policy configuration of the router switches and firewalls, which is different than the provisioning and the orchestration thereof. And then you've got this notion of distributed state, which you need in many cases if you're exporting and allowing workloads to interact, this kind of analytics plane. So, it's really hard to think of this as a single point of source of truth because the the persistency as well as the um, uh, consistency of the types of data we're talking about, some are very ephemeral and some are very long-lasting, meaning mm -hmm. you may not see a lot of um, uh, network configuration changes. I mean, that they may stay relatively persistent and consistent. You may see a ton of network state changes, as you can imagine, right? Because yeah. I've got flow tables updating, arc tables, map tables, power rules. Uh, so you really have to think about, it's, it's much more complex than just, okay, we have this, ex everyone kind of visualizes SDN and the OpenFlow model, we just have this one controller off to the side, yeah. and it just configures everything. Yeah. That's probably the furthest from the truth you're going to get, because as you look at these okay. heterogeneous environments, you're going to have lots of controllers interacting with lots of other controllers, because everyone's got their own, their own version of the truth, right? Yeah. Which makes sense, but it also obviously you know, makes it ridiculously complicated to secure from an audit perspective. It can. So as a best practice, uh, what do you recommend to secure uh, an SDN environment? Yeah, well, so I think, you know, I'll, I'll speak specifically. If you, can, if you can do this from a, it's always easy to talk about blueprints and architecture from a single vendor point of view. And, and so I, I, I would do that only because when you're talking about best practices, because there's a lack of standards, it's, it's almost impossible to suggest that vendor A and vendor B are going to agree on the mechanisms, unless there's a push for standardization, on how you get from, from here to there. I think threat modeling, um, risk analysis, being able to attach policy um, to the actual workloads themselves, and then understand uh, how those threat vectors would manifest themselves, where you were an attacker thinking about compromising the network, um, is, is just a common basic starting point. I mean, we. I, I don't think that, that there's anything that SDN brings to the table that when we think from a threat modeling perspective we haven't seen before any time we've gone from centralized to distributed back to centralized. Right? And, and you know, the, the notion here is that if we can get some consistency in approach, and we have them in standards like SSL, TLS, right? we, we know how to encrypt, we know how to use certificates, um, although you know, we've had some challenges with that lately in cloud-based services where certificates expire and entire cloud services go bye-bye. But we Hooray need Azure. Yeah, I, so the, uh, the the interesting thing here is a, a lot of it is common sense. A lot of it is really understanding again um, what the workflows look like, how these orchestration provisioning systems are going to uh, interoperate, um, and and. I hate to say it, but a lot of it's common sense and auditing, logging, forensics capabilities. Um, in many cases, what it really means is we need policy arbitration in the controllers so that if somebody, you have, you have kind of two classes of, of, of policy, one that's uh, automated and completely dynamic, meaning the, the actual SDN controllers can, uh, can by themselves decide whether or not a particular flow should be instantiated based on policy. The others are such that if I have an asset of a particular criticality level, where where 
I've tagged this and I want to make sure that I flag a workflow that is not automated requires a meat cloud intervention, a human, yeah. that I have that capability also. Because in many cases, it's the feedback loops here where security people who call up generally don't trust automation very much at all. So we need to be able to you know, get to the point that we can automate absolutely as much as we can, but have the exceptions of being able to look at when things are touching very high, high risk, high critical uh, assets that we have the capability to moderate those manually also.